Our subject is conspiracy. It is a generic offense which necessarily involves some target offense or offenses, such as conspiracy to commit armed robbery or conspiracy to commit murder. Conspiracy doctrine rests on the idea that concerted criminality poses a special danger to society, one that is greater than uncoordinated criminality perpetrated by individuals. You should get into the habit of mentioning the target offense or offenses each time you speak of a charge of conspiracy. Never leave anyone wondering, conspiracy to do what? Any more than you would leave anyone wondering, attempt to do what? or accessory to what? Avoid using the term collusion, which is a journalist's concept, not a lawyer's. Similarly to what we saw in the case of attempt liability, punishment for a conspiracy to commit offense X is not always pegged to the grade of the target offense X. This means that in some jurisdictions, and for some target offenses, the punishment for conspiring to commit X is significantly greater than that for simply committing X without conspiring. Moreover, conspiracy is an inchoate offense, like attempt, meaning that a defendant can be convicted of conspiracy to commit X, even though X was not in fact committed or even attempted. Charging a conspiracy to commit X also gives the prosecution a number of procedural advantages, which are covered not here, but in advanced elective courses. For our purposes, we need only note the misgivings that many commentators have voiced about the potential reach of the law of conspiracy. The famed criminal defense lawyer Clarence Darrow wrote, If there are still any citizens interested in protecting human liberty, let them study the conspiracy laws of the United States. Because it criminalizes networks of interaction that can be of enormous size and complexity, Justice Robert Jackson referred to conspiracy as that elastic, sprawling, and pervasive offense. We can only guess what Justice Jackson and Clarence Darrow would have had to say about more recent federal statutes such as RICO, the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, which go even further than the law of conspiracy to give prosecutors an arsenal of weapons to use against organized crime. We do not have time in our first year course even to do justice to the many facets of conspiracy. How should we define the term criminal conspiracy? It is usual to cite Justice Holmes's dictum a conspiracy is a partnership in criminal purposes. To abbreviate this to a partnership in crime could obscure, obscure the fact that a conspiracy to commit X can be charged in addition to the commission of X and can be charged even if X was never in fact committed or attempted. What kind of proof will suffice to establish a partnership of criminal purposes? Direct evidence will often be lacking. Courts allow evidence of similar actions of alleged co-conspirators to go to the jury when, but only when, the nature of the acts would logically require coordination and planning. Notice that liability for conspiracy can be incurred well before liability for attempt to commit the target crime is incurred. Is the actus reus then simply the agreement and purposes? That was the position at British common law. In a prosecution for conspiring to rebel against the crown, the court wrote, It seems an absurdity to say that procuring a single stand of arms should be a sufficient overt act to make the disloyal design indictable, but that conspiring with a thousand men to enlist should not. But American courts have often insisted that the prosecution show, in addition to the agreement and purposes, some overt act showing that the agreement is at work and not mere talk. But there are many exceptions, 
And in the case of some federal statutes, the absence of an express overt act element has been interpreted as conveying a congressional intention not to require the prosecution to prove one. Now let's consider further the mens rea of conspiracy. The actus reus is an agreement in criminal purposes, with or without a separate so overt act, which might not qualify as unequivocal or substantial if viewed from the perspective of the law of attempts. But what of those who knowingly facilitate the criminal conduct of others? We have already encountered this issue in connection with accessorial liability, where the settled doctrine, apart from the most serious offenses, is that purpose must be shown over and above knowing facilitation. What is the answer in the case of the defendant facing a conspiracy charge? The case of People v. Lauria opens a window for us. Lauria ran an answering service which a number of his customers, not all of them, used in order to prostitute themselves sexually. Lauria knew what was going on and profited by it, but was he guilty of conspiracy to commit prostitution? The Lauria court framed the question in terms of the quality of proof of knowing facilitation that might support a jury inference of purpose. Lauria sifted the precedents and found sufficient evidence in cases involving inflated prices, sale of goods with no legitimate use, sales in outsized quantities, where sales are much of a seller's business, and where the sale is known to facilitate a serious crime. Fortunately for Lauria, the court found that the evidence in his case could not warrant a jury inference of purpose. For all the evidence showed, Lauria was merely charging the prevailing market rate for a service that prostitutes could easily find elsewhere and which other customers used lawfully. It will be useful to compare com conspiracy doctrine to attempt doctrine. They are our main so-called inchoate offenses. Inchoate meaning possibly unfinished. An individual acting entirely alone is capable of committing an attempt crime. But a lone individual cannot be charged with conspiracy even if it is his, her intention to enlist others. It takes two to tango, two or more, and each conspirator is deemed to be a co-conspirator of everyone else involved in the conspiracy, whether or not known to each other. If an attempt is successful, a charge of attempt cannot be added to the charge for the completed target offense. The attempt is said to merge into the completed target offense but a conspiracy does not merge into its successful target unless the conspiracy has but a unique target purpose. Conspiracy to rob banks may be charged in addition to the robbery of Bank A, Bank B, and Bank C. But conspiracy to murder Bob's uncle cannot be charged under the Model Penal Code in addition to the murder of Bob's uncle. The sentence for an attempt offense is typically key to the sentence for the target offense, usually at some discount. Punishment for conspiring to commit offense X is not always key to the punishment set for X. Under federal law, a conspiracy to commit any offense X is punishable regardless of the maximum sentence for committing X. This can lead to harsh results. As our casebook editors note, hitting a federal official with a thrown tomato is punishable by no more than a year in prison. But conspiracy to throw the tomato is punishable by up to five years in prison, even if the tomato is never thrown. Lastly, the actus reus of an attempt offense consists of more than mere preparation, a substantial step under the MPC or dangerous proximity to success under Rizzo, but the bare agreement sufficed at common law, 
and under American statutes that require some overt act, the act need not constitute much more than some merely preparatory step. One more aspect of conspiracy doctrine is worth mentioning. It is illustrated by our Pinkerton case. Daniel Pinkerton was convicted of conspiracy to violate federal liquor law and several target sales of untaxed liquor. Some of these sales were transacted while Daniel was imprisoned on other charges, and there was no evidence that he knew anything about them. Nonetheless, Daniel's convictions for conspiracy and for the several substantive counts were upheld. Conspiracy doctrine can fasten liability to defendants who would not be convictable as accessories to the substantive offenses. To convict an accessory, it must be proven that it was the defendant's purpose that the conduct constituting the substantive offense occur. Under Pinkerton, all conspirators are liable for all substantive offenses that are within the scope of the conspiracy and reasonably foreseeable to occur. Daniel Pinkerton was part of an ongoing conspiracy to sell moonshine, and it was reasonably foreseeable, even from prison, that his brother would continue the business until Daniel was released. To convict someone as an accessory, the dominant and better doctrine is that the accessory must be shown to have that degree of culpability that is required to convict the absolute perpetrator. Note, of course, that jurisdictions that accept the Luparello doctrine require less than that. Those who recruit another to commit an offense are liable should the principal foreseeably commit other crimes. Pinkerton extends the co-conspirator's liability to substantive offenses within the scope of the conspiracy. Other cases, such as the Bridges case, dispense with the within-the-scope limitation and essentially track Luparello. A conspirator's liability extends to any reasonably foreseeable substantive offense a co-conspirator commits, even if it was not within the scope of the conspiracy. For example, if A conspires with B to rob a bank, and B, on B's own initiative, buys a machine gun to use in the robbery, A may be liable under bridges for possession of an illegal firearm. Note that the model penal code is contrary to the doctrines followed in Pinkerton, Bridges, and Luparello.